So I'd like to invite you to join me in seeing a world where every young person can succeed regardless of their parents' financial circumstances. Imagine, if you will, a world where every young person can expect to have a college education if they would like to. Imagine a world where every young person could become an owner of a place to live if they so desire. And imagine a world where every young person could become an entrepreneur if that is their dream. The absence of family wealth creates an obstacle for young people to achieve those kinds of goals and aims. Indeed, we could argue that the absence of family wealth creates a situation in which young people have shuttered opportunities. And we can do something about this, but we have to be bold in taking action. What I would like to propose is a policy that's been developed by a growing team of researchers under my leadership in collaboration with Derek Hamilton at the New School. And the idea is to provide every newborn infant with what we would like to call a trust fund or a custodial fund. But it would be a trust fund or a custodial fund that would be financed by the federal government. So in, in effect, it would be a publicly financed uh, custodial fund. The idea is the following, that every child would receive this fund at birth and would have access to it when they reach maturity, say at the age of 18 or 21. Why would we do this? Because what we would be attempting to do is to offset the financial disadvantages that they might incur if they come from families with limited assets. So in uh, the standard stump speech that I give about these set of ideas, I argue that since this would be a universal program, we would give $500 to kids who are born at the upper end of the wealth distribution. But for children who are born into families at the lowest end of the wealth distribution, we would give them an award of approximately fifty to $60,000. And because young people would know that they would have access to this publicly provided financial asset from a very young age, it would function psychologically as an asset as opposed to a lottery winning. And it would make it possible for young people to begin to imagine a future in which they have a set of resources that would facilitate their dreams and possibilities. Now, why is the focus of this particular initiative on wealth instead of income? Well, let me begin by trying to define wealth for you to distinguish it from income. So wealth is the difference between what you own and what you owe. It's the difference between the value of your assets and the value of your liabilities. It is the net worth that you possess or the net value of your personal property. And it provides a set of options that are not provided by income, which is a flow of resources that's predominantly uh, determined by your earnings. So if we think about the situation that is associated with higher levels of wealth, we can think about a range of facets of economic security that are very, very critical to our lives. Uh, let me start with the example of financial emergencies. Suppose a family loses a job, or suppose a family incurs a catastrophic illness. These are significant and dramatic effects on the family's capacity to provide for itself. And as a consequence, uh, if you have a significant amount of wealth or an adequate amount of wealth, those kinds of emergencies are not going to be as dramatic. And keep in mind that the average family in the United States has less of an ability to meet emergencies than we might typically imagine. For example, the average American family, if it's faced with $500 of additional expenses, cannot meet those expenses without going into debt. 
In addition, if we think about the, uh, the capacities that wealth gives us in other arenas, the ability to purchase a home, the ability to purchase a home in a neighborhood that has high cachet public schools, or to send one's kids to a private school, uh, wealth provides the ability to engage actively in the political system in a country that relies heavily upon uh, financial, uh, financial contributions to politicians for, for, them to, uh, for them to be successful. Wealth also enables individuals to, give, uh, to leave bequests for their children uh, and for their grandchildren. It also enables them to provide gifts during the course of their own lifetimes, what we call in more technical jargon in vivo transfers. Uh, so wealth is an enabling dimension of people's lives that we are thinking we should give all young people access to. Now, uh, let me talk briefly about how significant these wealth disparities are across our society and how little some groups in our society have. Now, I've already pointed out that the typical family cannot meet $500 in additional expenses without having to accumulate new debt. It's also the case that individuals who are homeless, approximately 50% of people who are homeless actually have a job, but they don't have adequate resources to provide themselves with sufficient shelter. So if wealth was distributed in a more equal fashion, they would have a capacity to live in a more economic secure context. Okay. Now, I also want to emphasize that these kinds of adverse effects of wealth inequality actually are even more pronounced when we look at the black American community. It's interesting to note how dramatic the differences are between black and white wealth in the United States. Uh, the typical black family has about 10 cents to the dollar of net worth that the typical white family has in its possession. And if we think about the actual numbers here, we're talking about a distinction between $17,000 for the median black family. That's the black family at the middle of the wealth distribution among blacks versus $176,000 for white families in the middle of the wealth distribution for all white households. Okay. That's a very dramatic and striking difference and it's not explained in the standard ways that people think about this. So one of the obvious explanations that people give for these kinds of dramatic or glaring wealth disparities is to argue that it must be attributable to the fact that uh, black folks uh, are, are not as eager to acquire education. And so education reduces the amount of wealth. Here's the key point though. We've found that blacks with a college degree actually have two-thirds of the net worth of whites who have never finished high school. Another argument that's made is, well, wealth tracks income. So if we, if we looked at black folks with higher levels of income, they would have comparable levels of wealth with whites. This isn't true either. Black Americans whose incomes fall in the middle of the American income distribution have lower levels of wealth than whites who are in the poorest 20% of the American wealth, uh, the American income distribution. Some people say it's because of a lack of financial literacy, uh, but there's absolutely no evidence to demonstrate that people at comparable levels of income, black or white, have very different degrees of financial literacy but if they are black or white, they have very different levels of wealth. Finally, some people have argued that these kinds of disparities are attributable to family structure differences between blacks and whites. Well, the evidence, on the other hand, tells us that black families with two parents have two and a half times less of the wealth than white families with a single parent. So we have to craft a very different narrative to explain these kinds of disparities. And the narrative that I would like to craft focuses on the historical conditions in the United States. 
historical conditions that are associated with the way in which white supremacy has played out in this country. So I would begin that narrative by talking about the failure to provide black Americans with 40 acres that were promised in the aftermath of the Civil War. That's the beginning of the process of distinctive racial patterns of wealth inequality in the United States. Uh, the second thing that occurs is a process of seizure and appropriation of land that actually was accumulated by black Americans between the end of the 19th century and then the early part of the 20th century. But to compound that, there was a series of, of, of white massacres that were conducted across the country in the interval between 1868 and the 1940s that led to vast amounts of destruction of black property, especially in communities in which there was evidence of black prosperity. One of the strongest examples is the case that has occurred in North Carolina in Wilmington in 1898. And perhaps the most dramatic example was Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 in which white rioters actually dropped incendiary devices from airplanes onto the Greenwood community, the black neighborhood in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But subsequently, there were other ways in which prosperous black communities were actually damaged or destroyed. And these ways were less obvious than the sheer violence that was executed in these white massacres. The ways in which this occurred are ways that actually apply to Durham, North Carolina. And this is by the process of the construction of a federal highway system that frequently ran routes directly through the heart of black business districts across America. And the specific instance in the Durham context is the destruction of the Haytai district by the creation of Highway 147. In addition, you know, things, things are not good, but they get worse, okay. <laughs> In addition, there was a set of public policies that were adopted in the aftermath of World War II that were the strongest attempts in the United States, uh, in the history of the United States, to produce greater social mobility. And these public policies included the GI Bill and a federal subsidy program to assist people in becoming homeowners. These two pieces of legislation had the strongest impact on providing individuals in the United States with the opportunity to move upward to the middle class. Well, what went wrong? What went wrong is the decentralized administration of these policies led to vast uh, underutilization on the part of, of blacks and vast overutilization on the part of whites so that you did not have the same kinds of benefits flowing to both communities. And so as a consequence, you widened the wealth gap. And by the decentralization, I'm talking about the capacity of local southern administrators to make the decision about which veterans would have access to the full benefits associated with the GI Bill and to make decisions about who would have access to the types of loans that would support uh, mortgage payments. Okay. So that's the story I would like to tell about why we have the racial wealth gap. I'd like to add at this point that what I've really given you is a narrative about why we should have reparations. What I would like to talk about today is why the baby trust proposal might make some headway in addressing not only general wealth inequality in the United States, but to some degree, racial wealth inequality. Here's the key, the key point about that. Two researchers at the Brookings Institution, Richard Reeves and Isabel Sawhill, have made a distinction between race-conscious and race-unconscious policies. Now, race-conscious policies are not necessarily race-specific policies. So I want to be very clear about this. 
reparations as a program to address the history of injustice against African Americans is a race-specific pro program. But the Baby Trust is a program for all American infants. It is, however, in addition to being race-neutral, it is also race-conscious in the following sense. A race-neutral policy that can be race-conscious is one that addresses the needs of a particular community more intensely than another because that community is disproportionately deprived. So the fact that black wealth is so much lower than white wealth on average means that a program that would distribute wealth to young people on the basis of their family's financial resources would have a disproportionate benefit for black youths. It would not close the black-white wealth gap. That would require reparations. But it would certainly create a wider range of opportunities for our young people. This is a bold policy initiative and I think it's important that we continue to craft ideas that break with the status quo, not just incrementally change the status quo. I've said at a different point in time that unless we have people who think about ways in which we can produce dramatic change, we will not have dramatic change. I'm William Darity. And I like to count myself among those who think about making dramatic change. <laughs>